Have you ever been so excited for something that you planned out every little thing you wanted to happen? Maybe you wanted to go to a theme park or take someone on a date. But when an important moment arrives, things can happen that you couldn't have accounted for, like maybe on the big day you have a killer headache. As they say, the best laid plans of mice and men often go astray. The Founding Fathers encountered this in the first few years under the Articles of Confederation. They designed a government out of fear that a strong central government would do all of the things the British government had done to wrong them. But it would have been hard to anticipate how poorly things went under the Articles, especially after winning the war. By 1787, most states sent delegates to a constitutional convention in Philadelphia to figure out how to rescue the failing central government, which we'll be talking about today. Our learning goals are to explain why the Articles of Confederation were replaced rather than revised, describe three big debates at the Constitutional Convention and their outcome, describe Federalists' and Anti-Federalists' point of views on ratifying the Constitution, and explain why the Bill of Rights was adopted almost immediately after the Constitution was ratified. In the humid, hot air of Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, 55 delegates met in the Pennsylvania State House. To keep the proceedings private, allowing them to voice their real opinions without fear of judgment in the newspapers, the delegates kept all the windows and doors shut tight with no air conditioning. James Madison, a Virginia delegate, had arrived 11 days earlier and had been working on plans to scrap the old constitution entirely and replace it with a new one. That was not what the Congress of the Confederation had called for. This was a meeting to amend the Articles. Madison was determined to do it anyway because he believed the Articles were not worth fixing. He called for a government with three separate branches. It would have a two-house legislature with voting power based on a state's population or number of citizens. Having two separate lawmaking bodies would allow them to have a lower voting threshold. Madison also added an executive branch to implement and enforce the laws. It could be led by either a single person or a council, depending on the wishes of the convention. And he envisioned a judicial tribunal, a court of judges that were independent from lawmakers. This system drew upon Charles Montesquieu's idea that separating the powers between different groups of people could prevent tyranny. When this Virginia plan, as it became known, was delivered, it seemed extreme. Whew. Small states felt like they would get bullied by larger states and be forced to accept policies which didn't suit them. Northern states also worried about the enslaved population in the South and how it would be counted. To counter the Virginia plan, small states proposed a New Jersey plan, which did not have three separate branches or even a two-house Congress. It had a one-house Congress, with expanded executive and judicial functions. In other words, smaller states tried to do what they had been sent to do, revise the system that was already in place. Other plans were also presented, but after a few weeks, it became clear that most delegates did not think that any plan but the Virginia plan was up to snuff. Moving forward, the Congress focused on making changes to the Virginia Plan, meaning they intended to replace, rather than revise, the Articles. The biggest argument was about voting power in Congress. Large states believed that both houses of Congress should have proportional representation, awarding seats based on the total number of inhabitants in each state. 
In other words, big states would get more representatives and more votes. Smaller states believed that both houses of Congress should have equal representation, meaning that all states would have the same number of representatives and votes. That way, large states wouldn't win every vote. Eventually, the two sides reached a compromise. Roger Sherman proposed the obvious solution that a House of Representatives would have proportional representation and short term lengths of only two years. The Senate would have equal representation and longer term lengths, six years. Another debate was about whether enslaved people should be counted toward the population of a state. Southerners wanted them to be counted so they would have more votes in Congress. Northern states did not want to count enslaved people, which they said Southerners treated more like work animals than people and would not faithfully represent. The infamous three fifths compromise was the outcome of this argument, in which three fifths of the enslaved population would be added to the free population of each state. Another big debate was about the leader of the executive branch. The factions on this issue were formed based on how much the delegates feared a strong ruler. Some delegates favored a single person serving as chief executive who would be chosen by Congress. This person could act quickly and decisively in a time of crisis, and they could be trusted because they would be chosen by experts. A second plan was proposed in which a three member committee would be chosen from different parts of the country. Northern, central, and southern executives would be chosen by citizens within their respective region and serve together on a council. A citizen vote brought back fears from small states that candidates from large states would always win. The eventual compromise was that a single executive would be chosen by a special group of voters called the Electoral College. Each state would have the number of votes equal to their representation in Congress, and each state would determine on its own how those electors would be chosen. After four months, a plan was agreed upon at the meeting. Now, delegates had the task of bringing it back to the states and convincing the people to approve it. Two factions emerged a Federalist Party, which supported the new Constitution, and an Anti Federalist Party, which opposed the Constitution, fearing a strong central government with all the powers Americans had fought against. In support of the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay wrote the Federalist Papers, arguing in favor of the document. Their position was that the new system wasn't perfect, but that it would be strong enough to solve problems, unlike the Articles of Confederation. Some anti Federalists, including Melanchthon Smith and Patrick Henry, also wrote papers against the idea, but they were less effective. The most compelling anti Federalist argument was that citizens' rights were not listed or protected by the new Constitution. In the end, Federalists won the debate by promising that amendments would be written to address anti Federalists' concerns. After ratifying the Constitution, Madison wrote the Bill of Rights, awarding many rights and protections to the people. It was clear that the Articles of Confederation weren't working. At the Constitutional Convention, James Madison was able to convince the delegates to replace the original Constitution instead of amending it. A new Constitution was written outlining a three branch system. Supporters of new Constitution successfully convinced every state to approve its ratification. The Anti Federalists' legacy was the creation of a Bill of Rights, which provides strong protections for citizens to this day. In coming lessons, we will learn about the growth of the nation and challenges it faced in its earlier years, both foreign and domestic. Until then, remember to always be clever. Hey, hey.